Um, thank you everyone for coming. We've got the, all the important people at the least, so we'll, um, we'll make a start. I'm not sure how many people read the backgrounds, but um, I'll just sort of emphasise a few things that you should know about Kristen. So she obviously comes from Canada, did a BSc over there. She then had some time in the, at um, Honduras, which looked like a, an amazing place before she sort of got the bug to work on tropical marine science. She came here initially um, to do a coursework masters. I pulled her out of that and threw her into honours and she obviously got the records at first class honours to go on to a PhD. So and she's been doing some really interesting work looking at um, changes in growth rates of branching corals. So we've all heard the story about the massive corals apparently showing a decline in growth rate on the GBR and so her goal is to sort of see if that's more generally reflected in the in the other coral species. And for all the fish people we do know that only Acropora really matters. <laughs> Okay, thanks Morgan. Um, so yeah, I'll be telling you my PhD looking at the spatial and temporal variation in the growth of branching corals. So coral reefs form highly complex ecosystems, and as you can see from the photo here, that's really the corals that provide the structure to these ecosystems, as well as providing habitat, food, and shelter to many of the reef-associated organisms. However, declining abundance of corals have been observed globally, as well as regionally, with now an estimated one-third of corals at risk of extinction, from climate change and local stressors. And on the Great Barrier Reef, we've seen a 27 year decline in coral cover due to a combination of disturbances, um, but mainly cyclones, predation by crown thorn starfish, and coral bleaching. So one factor that actually determines a reef's capacity to recover is the growth of corals. So recovery is generally considered going from something barren like this um, to their pre-disturbance uh, condition uh, often having high coral cover. And slower growth rates can actually undermine the capacity to recover, reducing reef resilience. And it was shown in a modeled ecosystem that declining growth rates due to acidification, <coughs> as well as reduced survivorship from increasing temperature stress, can actually lower the threshold at which the coral community um, acting with local stressors strip, uh, switch from a coral dominant to an algal dominant state with increasing CO2. As well, when we're recovering, fast growing corals can actually kill their slow competitors through uh, things like shading, reduced water circulation, and or increased sedimentation. So uh, what's going on <coughs> with increasing CO2? Well, in Hawaii, they've been monitoring the increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide, which uh, about one third of atmospheric carbon dioxide actually gets absorbed into the ocean, leading to a subsequent increase in the partial pressure of CO2 and a subsequent decrease in the uh, pH of the ocean. So since the Industrial Revolution, the average surface pH um, has decreased by 0.1 units, and this is expected to continue to decrease by an additional 0.4 by the end of the 21st century. So if we just look at the schematic on the right here, you can see um, CO2 enters the ocean, combines with water to form carbonic acid, which quickly associates into um, bicarbonate and a hydrogen ion. This hydrogen ion then forms with the available carbonate in the ocean, therefore reducing the carbonate as well as calcium carbonate for um, marine calcifying organisms. And um, the modern calcium carbonate mineral for corals is aragonite. So when I talk about aragonite saturation, it's determined by this equation here. So reducing the available carbonate leads to a decline in the aragonite saturation. And this was modeled um, something a little closer to home in Australia. Looking from 1963 to 2006, they found on average a decline in aragonite saturation by 0.4 units. And this was using um, temperature, partial pressure of CO2, alkalinity, and salinity. Um, and I just want to bring your attention to the Great Barrier Reef here. Um, you can see Lizard Island in green here, as well as Heron Island, our southern um, Great Barrier Reef site. We do see latitudinal variation, but also continual decline um, in aragonite saturation. So along with ocean acidification, increasing temperature stress is likely to impact on coral growth. Um, LUF has found significant warming in tropical ocean waters um, in the last 60 years, which has lar largely tracked this land air anomaly, the light gray in the background. Um, so the growth and temperature response of corals is fairly well known. As we increase the temperature in corals, we increase the growth rates until some optimum value, at which point past that temperature we see a decline in growth rates. So due to increasing ocean temperatures, 
Um, corals are now just below these thermal optimum levels. So any cr increase in temperature is likely to lead to decreases in growth rates. And an increase in temperature by just one degree Celsius for a few weeks can lead to thermal bleaching, at which point corals expel the symbiotic and belly, um, where growth uh, ceases and can even lead to coral death. However, even before that point, it's likely we'll see this reduction in coral growth. So there's two common ways to measure coral growth. That's looking at linear extension or calcification rates. So linear extension is actually quantifying the extending coral, coral skeleton. Um, however, this is independent of any um, skeletal density. Um, but it's most common because of the ease of measure. So we often see this inverse relationship with linear extension and density because as we increase it, uh, linear extension, it leads to less um, packing of the skeletal materials. As well for calcification, it's actually the mass of calcium carbonate deposited per unit area. And this is the product of the density of the skeleton and your linear extension rate. And we often see this positive relationship between extension and calcification. So um, variations in these processes like linear, linear extension um, have led to two common distinct life history trade-offs on the reef, those being K-select and those being R-select. So K-select uh, species are characterized by being slow-growing, long-lived species, and they rely on things like persistence and competition um, to survive. Whereas for your R-select species, those are your fast-growing, short-lived species, such as branching corals. And they rely on um, invasion and dispersal, um, possibly by fragmentation. So for massive species, um, they produce these nice annual density banding couplets, which actually makes um, determining growth fairly easy. So for massive corals such as Prides, as I said, their growth is um, slow, as well as very uniform over the surface. Mm -hmm. So core analysis um, can actually produce a chronology of coral growth, similar to counting the rings of a tree. So we've seen declines in linear extension of massive species, such that in the Red Sea we found, uh, I, I didn't yield it, a 30% reduction in um, skeletal growth of Diplorastria heliopera. And as there was no change in ocean chemistry during this time, it was said um, that it was mostly attributed to ocean warming. And if we use projections from the IPCC, this coral may actually cease growth by 2070. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with a study by um, Diafidel on the Great Barrier Reef that showed that ma uh, massive Prides calcific calcification had declined um, since 1990 by 14.2%. And this was predominantly because the linear extension had declined by 13.3%. So while the cause of the decline remains unknown, um, the authors suggest that increasing temperature stress or declining aragonite saturation may actually be diminishing the ability of Great Barrier Reef corals um, to deposit, ca deposit calcium carbonate. Um, however, not all reports have been negative. At Abrolos, a subtropical location along um, Australia's western coast, they found that Parides calcification had actually increased by 23.7% um, between 1900 and 2010, and this was predominantly because it had the greatest increase in sea surface, temp sea surface temperature um, during that period. So, um, sea surface temperature, aragonite saturation, and light are all critical factors for calcification and photosynthesis of hermatypic corals. And as you can see, they all co-vary and decline with increasing latitude, limiting coral growth, growth and reef accretion. Um, so increasing temperature can actually lead to beneficial effects um, at these high latitude sites, whereas it's predicted that reducing aragonite saturation may actually hinder um, coral growth here. Now currently, there's not a clear, concise um, picture of what climate change is doing to coral growth, such that it's likely to depend um, on their location and where we've seen increasing temperature at some places, or increasing growth at some places and declines in others. So it's likely to um, be very specific to your location as well as possibly between the coral taxa. So I've showed you a lot on massive corals, but why do we really care about massive corals when we know it's really branching corals that dominate the substratum, accounting for a substantial amount of coral cover, as well absence in the Caribbean of um, acroporids has led to declines in the rugosity and complexity of coral reefs. And we know it's these corals that are actually the most sensitive to disturbances, such as bleaching events, cyclones, crown of thorn starfish, and uh, reductions in aragonite saturation. So for me, uh, measuring coral growth in branching species 
Um, they actually don't produce density banding couplets because of the nature of their coral growth. Um, that's because branch corals such as Acropora, they have first primary growth, which is rapid distal growth at the tips, and then secondary growth in filling of the skeletal pores um, to strengthen and avoid excessive breakage. Um, so we actually see these um, variation in density down the coral skeleton. So to really get a good understanding of coral growth in branching corals, we need to look at linear extension, we need to look at density, and from that we can then look at calcification rates. So because we don't get annual density bandits, we don't get a chronology of coral growth. So the only way to actually measure changes in coral growth is to compare to some historic data. Um, so I'll just tell you about the methodology that we use to measure coral growth, and that's using a lizard in red as well as tagging. Um, so I put, for my Acropora miracata colonies, I put a bag around each, each branch, um, inject alizarin into the bag at a concentration of about 10 to 12 milligrams per liter. Um, this then stays on the reef for a minimum of four hours, at which point you take off the bags, and then I come back at the end of my sampling period, which for me is six months. Um, I have to collect my branches, put them in a dilute concentration of bleach to actually remove the tissue, at which point you can see as calcification took place with the dye, the coral became pink, and then any new growth from that period on is your linear extension rate. Um, so similarly for my whole colonies of Pedamicornis, um, I can just put them all in one giant bag, and again, 10, milligrams, uh, 10 to 12 milligrams per liter of solution. Um, so for tagging methodology, um, you just attach a cable tie around the branch tip, measure the distance to the end of the branch at the start and end of the study, and any variation in your branch length is therefore your linear extension rate. So Bacadal in the Caribbean had looked um, using tagging methodology at the linear extension rate of Acropora palmata and found a decrease of 7.2 to 10.7% between their sampling periods 1971-73 and 2002-2004. So while a lot of work has been done to actually measure changes in uh, growth of corals, no comprehensive study has actually looked at variation in growth of branching corals on the Great Barrier Reef. So that brings me to my aims, which is um, generally to test for temporal and spatial variation in growth of branching corals at a range of different locations. In doing so, I'll be determining growth um, uh, for a range of coral species at the latitude and limit of reef formation, as well as uh, testing for decadal changes in growth of coral species. Um, investigating the environmental controls on branching coral species along latitudinal gradient, and then determining any synergistic effects between um, carbon dioxide and temperature on coral growth. So for chapter one, um, we went to Lord Howe Island, which is the latitudinal limit of reef accretion, and um, we measured growth using two different methods, and we can test for decadal changes in growth by comparing to data collected by Vicki Harriet in 1995. So Lord Howe, as you can see right here, is significantly south from the Great Barrier Reef. It's about 600 kilometers off the coast of Sydney. Um, we get two study sites, um, Horseshoe Bay and North, North Reef. North Bay, sorry. So I just want to remind you that increasing temperature in subtropics has been shown to actually have a positive effect. And this is most likely due to the fact that in subtropics, coral growth is actually constrained by these cold winter temperatures. Um, however, the study that Cooper did, it looked at growth of parietes, and um, Fabricius, looking at a study on volcanic carbon seeps, had shown from going to a controlled pH, um, going to more acidic environments, that we actually see absence of these structurally dominant branching corals to a community that's just dominated by these massive parietes. Now, similar low calcification rates at both high and low um, pH suggests that parietes may actually be insensitive to changes in aragonite saturation or declining pH, whereas absence of these um, branching corals suggests that they're actually adversely affected to declining pH. So we kind of expect that with increasing temperature, we're going to get an increase in linear extension, most likely around here. However, we could be past that thermal optimum and we're going to see declining growth rates. As well, we don't know what's going on with the regulant saturation, and it's predicted that declining regulant saturation at the latitudinal limit of reformation is likely to hinder growth rates. So I had six study species, uh, Cropper yangai, Isopora cuneata, Poslopor demicornis, Seriopora hysterix, Stylophora pistillata, and Parietes heronensis. And so we used both our methods, alizarin stain and tagging. 
Um, we had about three branches for every tagged colony. Um, as well, for staining, there's a significantly smaller sample size because it actually requires sacrificing those corals. Um, but for every colony that was um, collected, I measured each branch on the colony. So for tagging methodology, um, there was no effect of location. So I've just combined um, the data here. As well, for staining, I had to combine the data to increase the um, sample size. But for both methodology, lizard staining and tagging, there was significant variation within and among coral species. Um, but regardless of method, the same trend is kind of ob obvious with the cropper young eye having the greatest linear extension being almost 2.7 to 4.2 millimeters a month. Um, however, P. Damocornis actually had the least growth being about 0.6 to 1 millimeters per month. So comparing to data that Harriet actually had in 1995, she also used staining methodology, so we have to use um, the same methods to compare. So for Pridus harinensis, we actually see no significant variation in the growth rates, um, and this was just using a t-test. As well for um, Cytopora hysterix, we see a slight increase in growth rates, although not significant, and you should know that um, Harriet actually only had one colony here, whereas we have um, substantially more. Um, however, for Ayana, you can see we see a 30% reduction in skeletal growth rates, going from about 4.2 to 2.7. Um, and similarly for P. Demicornis, we do see a 30% reduction, although it wasn't significant. So looking at um, the difference in temperature between the periods, we do see a slight increase in temperature um, by about 0.16. Um, degrees Celsius. Um, however, but what we should really look at is these maximum daily temperature values recorded, and you can see that there's actually no variation in our winter months, but the summer months it's almost two degrees um, Celsius higher. So while we expect increasing temperature to actually lead to increasing growth rates, we've seen a 30% reduction now in both um, two of our very important branching species. Um, so we can't definitively claim why coral growth is decreasing, but we can suggest that possibly increasing temperature stress or declining saturation state may actually be hindering coral growth here. So after finding that, we wanted to test um, some other tropical locations. So um, I've been going to Davies Reef where I want to quantify coral growth rates and test for decadal changes. Um, this was previously measured by Oliver in 1980-82 along the depth gradient. Um, so I get to take this beautiful boat out there. And just want to show you um, the environmental factors that change along the depth gradient. Well, light penetration, turbulence, and temperature all decrease with depth. Um, and because those are critical factors in actually determining coral growth, it's been shown um, in numerous studies that coral growth rates decrease with depth. Um, so at our uh, shallower sites where we get greater light intensity, it's been shown we actually get greater calcification rates of corals. So Davies Reef is uh, 100 kilometers northeast of Townsville. It's a mid-shelf reef. Um, and we went to the same site suggested by Oliver, which is right here. It's a 16-meter deep hole with a 9-meter opening at the front. Um, so wave turbulence is greatly reduced inside um, the little hole. And just want to show you some of the environmental data. Um, so the 1980-82 is just taken from Oliver's study there. And then I've got the mean um, monthly temperatures for the last two years. And you see there's actually not much variation in summer temperatures. And even in the latter study, um, they've had warmer um, winter months. So whereas at Lord Howe, we actually expected increasing temperature to favor an increase in growth rates, that might not be true for Davies. So for my methodology, um, I have 20 colonies that were stained in October at 5, 10, and 15 meters depth. Um, I went and collected my first sample last month, where I restained another 20 colonies, and this will continue for two years to look at uh, seasonal as well as any interannual variation. Um, and I'll just be using ANOVA to look at seasonal depth and annual variation, and uh, using a t-test to compare to past data that we have. So what we have so far looking at the summer data, um, you can see we see a decrease in growth rates with depth. Um, at five meters, it's about five and a half millimeters per month. We're at 15, we're just under four millimeters a month, um, and this variation was significant. 
However, looking at the summer data that Oliver had, um, you can see we're finding a stark contrast to what he had. He actually had increasing growth with depth. Um, and if you look at our 15 meter site, there's almost a threefold decrease in growth rates to what he had. Um, so I haven't done any stats on this yet, but just wanted to show you um, uh, the comparison and results. So I still have lots to do, we'll continue sampling for another year and a half, as well as try and investigate some of these reasons for the variation. Um, so for the corals that I've collected, I can calculate the coral density um, and then determine calcification rates. As well, I'd like to get some environmental data at each of these depths. Um, so looking at water clarity, as well as putting pH and light sensors out there, um, as well looking at water motion similar to Oliver had using the Paris Pod cards. So for those who um, aren't familiar, we're going to be using a secchi disc to look at water quality. Um, and it's often used vertically, but can be used horizontally. So one person just holds the disc while the observer swims horizontally away. And until you can no longer distinguish between the black and white, that's considered your secchi distance. Um, and for looking at Paris Claude cards, it's a plaster of calcium sulfate um, that you make a mold and fasten to a base and put on the reef and come back 24 hours later and you take your um, final weight and then based on weight loss you can actually convert it to water um, flow speed. So I just wanted to present some of the environmental data that Oliver actually had from 1980-82. Um, as we would expect, light at the deep site was 50% the shallower site, as well turbulence decreased from shallow to middle to deep. Um, he noticed decreased branching and increased spacing of branches at the deep site. Um, enabling light penetration and water flow to increase within the colony. So why are we seeing this decrease in growth rate? Well, it could be possibly due to declining pH, possibly thermal stress, or even um, a decrease in water quality and, sed and sedimentation actually hindering growth. Um, can't really conclusively say at this point. So that takes me to Lizard Island. Well, I will be analyzing the growth of PM Cornus and Amy Arcata, and we'll be testing for changes in growth um, since 1985, again, by um, that reported by Oliver. So just to remind you, at Lord Howe, we did see a 30% reduction in growth. As well, P. Demicornis has been reported in Pacific Panama to have a reduction in growth by one-third, going from 1974 to 2006, um, at a rate of about 0.9% per year. So I have four study sites. Um, these are my two P. Dam sites, and these are my two Miracata sites. So um, jo Jamie Oliver measured PM Cornus around Bird Island uh, here. As well, um, a cropper miracata wasn't actually a focal species in his study, um, but he reports linear extension in front of the research station. Um, however, anyone that went there last October would have noticed the mass of fleshy green algae that was suffocating most corals in front there. So um, we had to pick a different site where the corals would actually be less stressed. Um, as well, one of my PDAM sites was originally more exposed, um, and after going there six months later, the whole reef had basically been destroyed, whether due to cots or um, that storm in January, I'm not really sure, so I only have PDAM data on one of my sites at this point. So for each of my sites, I have 10 colonies of each species, um, or 30 branches of Miracata. And again, I'll be going October and April for the next two years. Um, and again, be using ANOVA to look at seasonal species and annual variation um, and comparing to past data using a t-test. So for Miracata, um, I do see significant site effects being almost nine millimeters per month at site, site one and three millimeters a month at site two. Um, but this is averaging about seven millimeters per month. And for P. Demicornis, um, I just want to show you what we had for site one. There's a quite big range in growth rates, um, but it's averaging about 1.2 millimeters per month. And these are my pretty pink corals up there. Um, as you would expect between these species, there's significant species effects, which Miracata is almost seven times greater than P. Amicornis. And just um, comparing to what Oliver had so far, this is taking his annual growth rates um, and converting it to monthly. You can see that Miracata is fairly similar to that reported. However, for P. Demicornis, we are seeing that 30% uh, reduction as well. Um, so I still have lots to do, calculate the density for my branches, um, as well as determining calcification. 
and getting some environmental data at each of these sites, such as light, temperature, and pH. So that brings me to chapter four, where I want to investigate the environmental controls of Pita Macornis and A. Miracata along the coast. So I'll be using the same um, staining methodology um, and data from previous chapters. And just want to remind you, um, we do see latitudinal variations in sea surface temperature on the Great Barrier Reef, where the uh, northern sites are almost two degrees warmer than the south. And as well, there's that predict, um, predicted latitudinal variation in aragonite saturation. So I've already showed you what we've been doing at Lizard, um, as well as Davies that have P. Demicornis colonies. So I've incorporated Heron Island as um, our southern site, where again I have two sites for both species, 10 colonies at each site, um, and I'll be sampling them October and April for two years. And as well for Lord Howe, we can incorporate the P. Demicornis, getting a really nice um, latitudinal variation. Um, so I just want to show you the Miracata results so far. Um, for P. Demicornis, similarly to Lizard, I've had uh, trouble collecting colonies. Um, so I'm just going to show you what I have for Miracata right now. And I need to wait until I get a little more P. Dam colonies to increase the sample size to show you um, the latitudinal variation. Um, but for Miracata, those colonies are pretty easy because they don't go anywhere. They're giant. Um, so from Lizard to Davies, five meters at Davies and Heron Island, you can see that with increasing latitude, we do see a decrease in growth rates. Um, going anywhere from seven millimeters a month to Heron is just about five millimeters a month. Um, however, using a mixed effects model, looking at growth with a um, fixed factor of latitude, and then adding in random factors of site, site colony, and branches, um, it was determined that the best fitting model just had the fixed factor of latitude and a random effective site, and it was determined to be not significant. Um, however, the sample size is still really small, and I'm pretty confident that after two years, when we get the sample size up, um, that we will see a nice latitudinal variation. As well, once we determine calcification rates for all these three sites, um, it'll be interesting to see if we see any variation in calcification. Um, so just want to show you the difference in temperatures between Lizard, Davies, and Heron. And you can see Heron Island um, is quite a bit cooler, being almost uh, two degrees different from Lizard. So we're seeing similar um, non-significant variation in growth rates at the both high and low sites, suggesting that um, the corals are probably well, uh, very well locally adapted to these sites. So still want to get um, my environmental data for each site, so sea surface temperature um, and light data loggers deployed, as well as pH. And again, using mixed effects models for my analysis, and then just looking at linear regression for any environmental effects. So to tease apart um, some of the effects we're seeing, um, I'll be using a tank experiment to investigate the synergistic effects of temperature and aragonite saturation on A. miracata and P. demicornis. Um, so from the preliminary data, I think it's fairly safe to say we're going to see a variation in growth rates compared to historic data. As well, um, I'm fairly confident that I'm going to see a latitudinal variation in growth and calcification by the end of the study. So why are we seeing these variations? Is it increasing temperature stress, declining aragonite saturation, or possibly a combination of both? Um, now, Manzello did a nice um, schematic here that shows that if it is just acidification, decreasing growth rates, we're likely to see just a um, gradual decline in calcification or growth. Whereas if it's um, thermal stress, then at whatever point of your disturbance, you'll see a decrease in growth rates where they actually can't return to your pre-disturbance conditions. Um, as well, it could be additive, leading to um, acidification and thermal stress combining. However, if it's synergistic, then these two models actually compound atop, on top of each other leading to a further reduction in growth than with any of the other models. So I'm proposing to take corals from Heron and Lizard Island. So when I go in October, I will um, create my coral nubbins and then leave them on the reef for six months. So they'll just be um, little individual branches like that for both my two species, P. and Miracata. Um, then we'll bring them back to uh, Townsville and put them in three different temperature treatments. Um, so Heron Island will be the Heron Island ambient and the plus two, plus four. And so the plus two for that is really just Lizard Island ambient. 
and the plus two is often experienced in the summer uh, temperatures, where then plus four would be um, your future values. As well, we'll do uh, then a cross with the three PCO2 treatments. So 400 was determined as the average value at Davies Reef, if anyone went to Rebecca Albright's um, chat a couple weeks ago. As well, 500 was the maximum value um, actually reached looking at natural variation due to tides and um, the daily cycle. And 600 here will then be considered the future value possibly reached by 2050. Um, so I'll have multiple branches in each of these treatments um, using a dark to light ratio of 12 to 12 hours, looking at linear growth as well as calcification. Um, so you can just weigh the coral nubbins weekly and then calcification be determined from this equation here. Um, we'll just be using ANOVA as well as linear regression to look for any correlations with any of the environmental um, factors. So it's my timeline here. Unfortunately, corals grow fairly slow, and I'm going to be getting a lot of my data at the end of this, um, as well as at the start of next year, getting the tank experiment going. Um, so hopefully I'll be nice and prepared with my thesis to submit three years after I started. Um, so we're intending to get some fairly significant publications out of this, um, hopefully submit chapter one next month. Um, as well as looking at you know, the decline in growth in Acropora on Great Barrier Reef, um, changes in growth at Lizard Island, as well as our latitudinal variation um, and the tank study. Just want to thank the center for letting me do all my research, as well as we just received, it, received some GRS funding. Um, yeah, any questions? Obviously, this is strictly what I call the meat shelf. Mm -hmm. Well, now it doesn't fit that perfectly, but anyway, it's a meat shelf study. Yeah. And you're looking at latitudinal and not cross shelf, which would be a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. So I think you should somehow emphasize that, that what's going on on the inner shelf is another whole world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and the DR study, of course, is mid shelf as well. Yeah. Not realised, I've not even said in the paper very well, unfortunately. Okay. Doesn't include many inner shelf reefs or even outer you know, shelf reefs like that. Um, and so this will be very good for the mid shelf, but I wouldn't be thinking you'd be able to necessarily extrapolate to the near shore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, the effects on intro is likely to be very different than yeah. in the shelf. Yeah. Water yeah. quality, salinity going on, changes, lots of ends that don't fit into those. Those ships are also quite accurately reflected within inshore massive columns, though, as well. There's a whole lot more variability with inshore corals yep. that's detected in infrared, so I think. In terms of trying to tease out historical shifts in response to Oregon and saturation state, a mid shelf site is probably the best place to start. Yeah. I think that's what John's saying. Uh, I, I would agree with John's comment that the method of paper didn't distinguish between you know, the net or sources of colonies. Mm -hmm. So we really don't know the cause of that decline. They said in their abstract it was probably due to in the mm -hmm. paper itself, and they're not quite as yeah, firm exactly. in that regard. So it may be that the decline in the last few years and the handful of colonies that came from the method of Erdogan, mm -hmm. we can't really tell from the right. There is another data set around, which you'll be able to get from Angus Thompson, that I use, which analyzes the coral condition, like the DRF paper. Remember, they got seven years of data for that from the Marine Monitoring Program. Uh, we see similar declines in some places, um, and that's sort of out there somewhere, you know. Um, Angus Thompson, the name, so I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll have that soon, so you can have that analysis of that six years of data on the initial for each, basically, there, yeah. um, showing some of the similar declines that the DR paper showed on the initial. Great, I'll look for that. Is there any way to ask if they can you do you guys have any questions? Can you can you hear? Oh. <laughs> can can you hear right? Uh, you still be on. 
Are you muted on that side? No. 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 Can you hear us now? Can you hear? Yeah. Yep. Uh, good. Uh, I just have a, a quick question. I think in chapter four or five, you have an schematic there that could suggest that if you have an effect of temperature, you may actually be able to come back after the disturbance. And if you have the combined effect, then you would have a stronger reduction in, the, in, in calcification. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have considered that that schematic is, it would be a specific only for discrete disturbances in temperature, not for chronic ones like the ones you are looking at. So in theory, if you have a chronic disturbance in, in temperature that is affecting your growth, you are actually not able to go back to your pre-disturbance condition as you do if you have a bleaching event, for example. Yeah, so in that paper when they're looking, um, yeah, when he has that schematic, it is looking at the shuffling in symbiont and that they can actually go to one of those thermally tolerant clads um, and getting to pre-disturbance condition. But yeah, if we are um, looking at, with a tank experiment using a, de a gradual um, decrease in temperature, then hopefully not bleaching the corals, that I would kind of expect to see more of a gradual decline than that, you know, cut off due to um, an acute disturbance. Is and, that and there's, yeah, yeah, that's, and there's an, uh, a comment I have, not a question, about your chapter five where, with yeah. your... Uh, experiment. I'm not sure if I saw that correctly because the font here looks small because it's a small screen, but I think your temperatures are plus two degrees and plus four degrees. Is that correct? Yes. I was wondering um, why you picked plus four degrees, which seemed a very, very big in increment and almost outside most of the projections, and whether it would be more sensitive if you only can have two, having perhaps plus one and plus two or plus one and plus three, because that plus one is quite important because it's what's going to happen in the last 50 years or so, and it's going mm -hmm. to tell. It's going to be very important depending on whether your corals are close to the optimum or not. While the plus four is a very extreme scenario that is very likely to give you a strong result, but not that ecologically relevant in my in my opinion. Yeah. So yeah, the temperatures are still going to have to be um, at, looked at exactly what we want to do. But I was more going looking at ambient temperatures and then plus four corals or sorry, plus two corals, uh, you know, experience a lot in summer months and they're, you know, able to live through that. Um, so yeah, it might be working worth then going either to plus two and a plus three. Um, yeah, so I'll definitely, I'll definitely consider that and, and think about which would be the appropriate temperatures. Thanks. Uh, I have one more question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, H have you considered that corals don't grow evenly over the year because some species after mass ble uh, sorry, after mass spawning they the, the, the next few months which is the end of um the end of spring and the beginning of summer they don't grow at all like and, and a lot of acropolis do these just after the mass uh, spawning because they they don't have any energy to grow so most of the growth in these corals uh, occurs at the end of summer and in winter so if you are comparing your data with data that was taken uh, many years ago, you have to make sure that you use the same um, months that, that you're comparing because you can't compare your growth in summer with their growth in winter because it will be two different things. Yeah, so the, the data, if you're looking um, at Davies there, that was looking at his uh, average summer data with ours as well. Um, but most likely when we publish, we'll be looking at the actual annual variation um, and then, you know, just suggesting the, the seasonal variation as well. But yeah, it will definitely um, match up the sampling periods. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone measured a racking length state or pH of the forehead? Not for how that I know of. I know Morgan tried to take some samples, um, but because, like Rebecca Albright did, you need to have kind of that comprehensive study where you take water samples almost every two hours kind of thing for a couple of weeks. Um, I don't believe anyone's done it yet. Sounds great. That's a lot of things. Serious 
series or when it's going to happen. That's what we we, um, we obviously plan to do the water sampling in all these locations, but as people who know, being a cat that the water sampling work is never going to be adequate. And it's, it's, it requires sort of working alongside someone like Rebecca to get the relevant measures. And she's already done Lizard and Davies. No, Davies and Heron, Sorry. not Lizard. Yeah. yeah. And it, I think I asked her that the other day, but now that she, the, her Davies paper is, um, it's, yeah, all right, 2013. Yeah, I, I mean, as I'm sure you know that when people show maps of the world, the contours of right now, it's, I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't tell you damn thing about what the color is Yeah. Stop. Yeah, yeah that's, that's definitely one of the limitations, so we'll be trying to get the right to data for um, all of my sites, and, you know, a lot of people have done work just modeling it, but, Ideally, it would be nice to get, you know, using Rebecca, and you know, so we have Davies. She says she has it for Aaron um, as well, not not even analyzed, and and yeah, so it'd be nice to get something for Lizard as well. She can do about twelve samples a day. So she has about five hundred Aaron samples that she's got. Right. So mm -hmm. five through the month of what we need. So it's, it's coming. coming. The Aaron <laughs> stuff's coming. Yeah, I was just wondering, going back to your tank experiments, whether you yeah. thought about maybe looking at cooler temperatures as well? Because I think there's some areas, and I think Lord Howe might be one of them, where there's some predictions that suggest it's actually going to get cooler because the East Australian current's going to shift away. Okay. Um, no, I didn't really consider looking at a cooler temperature um, just because the replication that we need already looking at warmer temperatures, um, but it would be interesting to see if that's more feasible or um, yeah. definitely something to consider. Because presumably at the moment you're assuming that they're at their optimum, so it would be kind of interesting to see if it does decline with cool land with cooler temperatures, cool temperatures. Yeah. but obviously I understand it's a lot more work if yeah. you do that. But. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting, something to think about. The water, water quality stuff, and you're thinking mm. of doing horizontal sticky dips, which is okay, Dave, you're talking about the old places. Yeah. Your problem is partly about what Morgan was talking about as well as timing. Mm. Um, you know, how many times you're going to do it, every can change. Yeah, change exactly. there with the wind and mm. resuspension of the yeah. in the shovel or the junior roots anyway. And, a whole lot of other things that will change on daily and mm -hmm. see an hourly. So you'll have, to, you'll, I think, you'll have real trouble getting some pattern of sampling that tells you anything. This is a problem doing water quality sampling mm -hmm. out there. But I mean, you know, we still do it, but do we believe we take two samples a year or yeah. 50 yeah. samples a year? Is that enough? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Um, so you just, you'll just have to think about it. That the temporal resolution of your sampling compared to the temporal resolution of changes in something like timidity right. out there that would affect the second depth. Mm -hmm. The other water quality thing as well, you know, I'm happy for you to come and talk to me at some time and I'll give you what I think I know about potential possible terrestrial water quality impacts at Heron versus Davies versus Elizabeth. I don't know about Lord Howe, but there's obviously some local ones. Yeah. I don't think that would be the most extremes, but I'm talking about big rivers, the Fitzroy River affects Heron yeah. at times, the Burdekin River affects Davies at times, mm -hmm. and not too much affects Lizard. That would be great, I would mm -hmm. definitely. And what data we've got, flood plume maps and yeah. whatnot, that sort of verify yeah. that there is some influence out there, possibly. Even if we're not. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely have to incorporate that stuff. So I'll send it in the chat. And you can also, of course, that's available daily. And the satellite went across a couple of hours ago, the moats. There's an afternoon of only one acre of terror, but it's usable to see um, flood plumes out there. there are, you can, to some extent, see the 250 metre resolution. It's free. Mm -hmm. You can get it an hour after it's gone over. Okay. If you've got the, well, we've got people who can do that. Yeah, he'll do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's very useful. Yeah.
Um, and uh, and they'll tell you about turbidity out there to some extent and some mm -hmm. revolution every day. Yeah. When it's not crap, when it's not crap. Totally. So that's sort of interesting as well. Yeah, definitely. Anyone else? Thank you.